The Tom Woods Show, episode 960. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, join Bob Murphy and me for the libertarian event of the year, the Contra Cruise. And this year, we're joined by special guests, including the great Scott Horton, the foreign policy expert you love from The Tom Woods Show. It's filling up faster than ever, so book right now at ContraCruise.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here, still in Auburn, Alabama, for the Mises Institute's Mises University program. I don't know if you'll be able to hear the rain in the background, but I'm actually recording this in an Airbnb we're staying in for the week. But in any case, what I'm sharing with you today is very recent. This is a Q&A session, live Q&A session I did with Bob Murphy, the great economist, at mylibertyclassroom.com, which is the site that teaches you history and economics the way they did not teach it to you in school. And we've got a whole bunch of courses you can listen to on the go there. But we also do these live question and answer sessions as well. The courses you can listen to whenever you want, but we do a live session once a month where we take your questions live. And I thought, well, I've got a recording of one of these that we did recently. We did this one with Bob. So why not do that? Now, if you're a longtime listener of the show, you probably know who Bob Murphy is. First of all, we together host Contra Krugman, a weekly podcast over at ContraKrugman.com. But Bob holds a Ph.D. in economics from NYU. He is the author of many books, most recently Choice, Cooperation, Enterprise, and Human Action. He's an associated scholar of the Mises Institute, a research fellow of the Independent Institute, and research assistant professor at the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech University. So this is a bunch of questions that were submitted live, and these are our live answers. Join us over at libertyclassroom.com, and if you're a Basic Plus or Master member, you also get these really neat live Q&A sessions. So check it out at libertyclassroom.com and save yourself some smackers by checking out our coupon page at libertyclassroom.com slash coupons, and here we go. Neither one of us is an authority on Venezuela, but you know what, Bob? We're not an authority on a lot of things we talk about. That never stopped us. How would you respond to someone saying that Venezuela is in chaos because of corruption, not socialism? Um, and I guess part of my answer would be that's what they always say about socialism, right? It's always corruption or bad weather or whatever, right? And yet there always seems to be, suspiciously, more bad weather and more corruption in all these places. But also normal corruption, run-of-the-mill corruption, does not generally lead to completely empty store shelves, right? It leads to one guy being on the take and they throw him in jail. So uh, what do you think about that, Bob? I, I think that's more or less the answer. Yeah, I mean, like, you could... Every time there's a plane crash, you know, you could say, oh, it's gravity, right? And that's not really a good explanation because there's always gravity. So it's not like if you 10 years ago surveyed all the governments of the world in Venezuela would be uniquely corrupt, you know, more so than any other government. I mean, off the top of my head, I don't know what the measures would have been, but, you know, I, I don't think that that was the issue. Also, um, I, I, no, I think what the person may have in mind, I heard a story on NPR. I was going to do an article on it one, and it just didn't happen. Um, I might have tweeted it or something, but the pr the premise, you know, so it was somebody from NPR doing a story on how there was no food. So I was curious. I listened very intently because I was curious to see how are they going to spin this in the NPR way that it's not like, yep, this is why you shouldn't do price controls and market prices convey useful information. You know, they're not going to say that because it's NPR. So what they said, um, and this might line up with what the person's asking, is they said, oh, it's because the, now the government you know, had measures in place to provide food and toiletries and stuff to the people. But then the government officials who were in charge of those distribution programs realized they could make more by selling it on the black market. So that's what those dirty capitalist pigs were doing. If only the government officials in Venezuela would have followed the rules like, you know, the, the leaders Dick promulgated, then we wouldn't have had all of these shortages. So that was the route they took on NPR that once again, it was inadequate government policy insufficient, you know, and people looking out for numero uno and the private profit motive that was really to blame here. So, yeah, I mean, if somebody's saying that, again, I mean, you can say, well, that, yeah, there's always going to be an issue. And also, kind of like with 
what Krugman's, you know, Krugman said, oh, yeah, Obamacare would have worked fine, except some of those dirty Republican governors didn't take the free money from the federal government. OK, if you, you can't say, oh, yes, this political program would have worked if not for politics. So the same thing, it, even if that were true, and I think that that's not exactly, in other words, even if those Venezuelan government officials had been handing out toilet paper and stuff the way the, the program said, there still would have been massive shortages and people would still be destitute. But even on its own terms, the fact that, oh, this system would rely on thousands of government employees doing what is totally against their self-interest, well, that, that's a reason not to have that program. So, you you know, that that's not the fault of capitalism since price controls and money printing are not capitalism. All right. Let's <clears throat> let's ask this question, because it you could answer it on a deep philosophical and methodological level and you could answer it on a more surface level. How important are math skills really to being a good economist, like advanced calculus, for example? All right. I mean, you're the economist. So tell us. OK, well, I remember, I'm just the guy who reads about this stuff in his spare time. If people <laughs> listen to our Contra Krugman podcast, they'll get the reference there. Um, so it, I'll answer two ways, because I, I don't know if, if the questioner means like to, as a career or just in my own, you know, as, as someone in my spare time who wants to know economics and be considered a good economist for the ages. So if you mean just your own personal knowledge, uh, no, you, you don't need that much math, I don't think. In other words, the, like the history of economic thought class that I'm doing for Liberty Classroom and, you know, up through the 20th century, I think if you go through that, I'm going to give you like a survey of all the major stuff. In a few of the lectures, you need to be able to follow a rigorous, you know, precise chain of argument, but you don't need to know calculus or anything. Um, so I think, yeah, you could be a good economist. In, this, in the same way, Adam Smith was a great economist, but I don't know that he knew, you know, that he could that he could have gotten through a, a, a modern math program, mathematical economics program. But if you mean, yeah, I want to do this for a career, uh, and I'm, but I'm not sure, you know, math's not my strong suit. Yeah, unfortunately, at least in the United States, to get a PhD in economics, then if you want to teach, um, being not being afraid of math is, is going to be a, a, a big help to you. So I mean, there's, I don't want to mislead you. There are people like. You, you could get a degree somewhere and be fine and just kind of slug through it. But it, it's, it's going to be tricky if like, if you hate math or something. Scott asks, are there, I'm taking this one for a reason you'll see in a minute. Are there any academic institutions offering degrees in praxeology? Well, I can say without having checked with all of them, the answer is no. But what's interesting about that question is that Mises has always described economics as being a branch of this larger science of praxeology this is a study of human action. So I guess what I would ask Bob out of this would be, because what I take the question really to mean is, if we're if economics is merely a subset of praxeology, where's the rest of praxeology? Right, right. See what I'm saying? Now, first of all, I, I'm going to put in the chat window a link to a talk I gave years ago explaining praxeology, which is the Austrian method, uh, because I remember for a long time I – I understood what praxeology was, but I, I never quite got how you get from human beings act to the law of demand. How, how does he, how do you, what are the steps? So in that talk, I actually walk people through the steps, how you get from here to here. And then I've basically implicitly shown that you don't have to test the law of demand. You just follow this, this stream of reasoning. And if you see nothing wrong with it, then the law of demand is what it is. So there that is in the chat. So what do you think about that, Bob? You've certainly given this some thought. Yeah, so um, let me, I'll answer the question so I don't make sure I don't forget, but then let me just say a couple of remarks on like what is praxeology and what, what does Mises mean by economics being a subset? So uh, I have seen people who like or have working papers on that kind of stuff, you know, saying, oh, this is a, pre I don't know that any of them ever got published. I'm not saying they didn't. I just, I, you know, the, the stage at which I became aware of them, the person was working on it, say, hey, what do you think of this? And my typical answer is, well, I'm really swamped. I'll look at it. Yeah, that looks kind of cool. Good luck. Uh, I say that a lot. Um, and then, but I think, Tom, does this sound right to you? I think Rothbard in Power and Market did, did like a typology of violent interactions. So in other words, he was saying, oh, in the first half, what we now call man economy and state, I was doing you know, the analysis of voluntary interactions with property rights and money. 
you know, what we call catalactics and, and then talked about, you know, socialism and whatever. But then I think he had a typology of intervention, like with, you know, bilateral intervention. And I yeah. think Rothbard thought that's still all praxeology. It's just not the market. Huh. Okay. Okay. I guess I can accept that. <laughs> you look like you're reluctant, though. It just seems like there should be more, right? I mean, when he keeps constantly harping Mises on uh -huh. uh, economics being a subset of praxeology, and I think of praxeology. So, in other words, would all these little subsets of praxeology also start with the action axiom, or would they start with other axioms? I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm getting too much too complicated. Yeah, I mean, you could – right. So, And I think that's what Rothbard was trying to do. So, I mean, you know, just given the people – so for people who don't really know what we're getting at, so praxeology is like the logic of choice or the science of human action. And at first you might think there's not much you can do with that if you don't start making assumptions about like, oh, there's a medium of exchange or – labor is onerous or something, but there are like, you know, just to, to interpret something as an action, you know, you see a human's body moving around and for you to say, oh, that's an action as opposed to just matter in motion, the way like you saw a rock falling, you wouldn't call that action in the Misesian sense. You're implying that there's a distinct mind that has goals, you know, and is, is making choices. And so and right there, there, oh, there must be a choice that things make. So there's a trade-off involved. So there's opportunity cost. So, I mean, just the the concept of action, once you go down that path, it implies a bunch of stuff that you normally think of as like economic concepts, but they're actually, they're not really just about market exchange. They're, they're more general about, you know, purposeful behavior from a, from a rational being. So yeah, time to answer. I, like I said, I've seen people who do stuff like, like a, a praxeological approach to international relations. Yeah. So I just don't know that they have any, you know, any real solid results. I mean, I guess you could say that like what, what game theory people do, like with certain like cooperative game theory and stuff. I mean, they kind of almost geometric proofs with that stuff. I think part of the issue is the people working on that don't know about Mises. So they wouldn't even know to call that right. exactly. technology and yeah. vice versa. The people who go to you know the Mises who might not be aware of that literature, but I guess strictly speaking, you could call that praxeology. How would you respond to capitalism causes slash promotes greed? Well, first of all, causes greed seems highly implausible. Like there was no greed until suddenly people were free to exchange with each other. Seems unlikely. Um, the less free you are to exchange with other people, the poorer you are. And I think the poorer you are, the more obsessed you are with material things because you're barely clinging to survival. That's probably all you think about is material things. The wealthier you become, the less obsessed you are with material things because you have more of them. So, for, you know, nuts to that. But then promotes greed. Well, I kind of like uh, the Milton Friedman answer, which is that, for example, communism does not get rid of greed. It just channels it in an extremely antisocial direction. The apparatchiks have, you know, are greedy. And they channel that greed through the system in such a way that benefits them and them only. Uh, what they call greed really is, in a lot of cases, is just normal human desire for advancement and, and to provide for one's family. And basically, capitalism says if you want to get money, you got to do something for somebody first. Uh, I saw this. I, I thought this was great. I mean, most Facebook memes drive me crazy. But I saw one the other day that was like capitalism says – if you want something, well, first you have to do something for somebody. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Whereas socialism is, if you want something, you should just get it. Like you deserve it because you exist. Well, which one of those sounds like a virtue you want to inculcate in your children? Children, just hold your hand out and stand there and wait. That doesn't not the kind of dignity I want to infuse my children with. But anyway, Bob, what do you say about this? I guess part of the difficulty is. You have to say, like, compared to what? And so I don't know, you know, what what is the, the, the baseline you're saying? Oh, you know, if we don't have capital, you know, what what's the human condition? What, what do you mean as opposed to, you know, so it's a, so I, I think there is a there's a certain type of person that I've encountered going into economics and that I think there is some element of truth in the fact that certain people, you know, reading Ayn Rand and watching, you know, the movie Wall Street with Michael Douglas and stuff. And there's a certain thing of if you can be convinced, oh, no, by me being greedy in the conventional sense, like I'm actually helping society. So I'm going to go ahead and do it. And I, so I have seen people sort of fall into that 
trapped somewhat. And I, I could imagine I'm open to the idea that someone's no, normal uh, willingness to like donate to a charitable cause or something because they studied a bunch of quote free market economics for 10 years. They might now think, no, no, I, I can't do that. I, I can't give to a soup kitchen because that would, you know, that would lessen the bums, you know, incentive to go get a job or so, you know, so I, I'm somewhat open to that. But again, like Tom was saying, what, what are we comparing it to? I don't, it, certainly conventional measures of charitable giving and stuff were much higher in the United States for long periods than comparable Western European countries that have much bigger government. So if that's what the, you know, if that's the more traditional welfare states, the baseline, no, I, I think capitalism actually makes you more charitable. How do Austrian economists explain warmonger leaders who are driven more by hatred of others so that they act in ways that economically damage their own people and allies. Well, I think what's implicitly contained in this question is the idea that Austrians or economists in general, but particularly Austrians, assume that people are always act with the material well-being of themselves or their country or something at the forefront of their minds. But we don't make that assumption. We just are all, all we say is that people have value scales and they have a, an implicit ranking of different ends that they might want to pursue. And all we would say about that situation is that on that leader's value scale, they place the, uh, the you know, carrying out violence against uh, uh, other peoples higher than they rank increasing the GDP of their own country. And, that, and that's all we can say about it. Uh, we wouldn't say that our analysis doesn't apply here or these people are being irrational. That's not the way Austrians talk. They just say, all we can say in this situation is that this particular person values the end that he's pursuing more highly than he values other ends. Um, what do you think, Bob? Yeah, I mean, you got to be careful because, strictly speaking, as Austrian economists, you know, if you're just using praxeology per se, yeah, you can't really say too much that's definitive because it's, if something's going to be a tautology, then it's going to be pretty open ended. I would say more like drawing on public choice economics. The way I would explain that is say, the rule, it's an unfortunate fact, but it's undeniable that for typically people in office get more power and can do more, you know, so from the ruler's perspective, he does do better on standard measures of consumption or whatever you want to say if the country's at war. Or at and least that's why he ranks it up there. Right. So, yeah, yeah so it's, it's sort of, and that, this is actually like the issue of, you know, why some people would say, like Hans Hoppe or something, I'm, I'm going to put words in his mouth, but I think he's would be fine with the spirit of what I'm going to say, is that, yeah, obviously he's a you know, Rothbardian anarchist in that sense, but if he has to choose between a traditional monarch, monarchy, hereditary monarchy, versus a pure democracy, clearly the monarchy is going to be less likely to plunge the people into silly wars and stuff because, you know, that they have the long-term, you know, benefit of their, of their, of their people to look out for. So certainly you don't want to get conquered. So you're not going to go pick a fight with a state that's more powerful than you, but it's not surprising that, you know, the U S government is always at war with like podunk country somewhere that allows the U S government officials to have more power than if we were truly at peace. What books would you recommend for a 10th grader who loved economics in one lesson and the law and loves math, but isn't a prolific reader, uh, not ready for human action. Well, even prolific readers sometimes aren't ready for human action. So what would we recommend for a 10th grade? I personally like um, How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes by Peter Schiff. It's, it's uh, you know, it's readable. It has illustrations in it. It's approachable. It conveys a lot of good basic information. So for economics, I would go there. I haven't read Whatever Happened to Penny Candy, which – by Richard Mayberry, with which a lot of people recommend. And if I don't mention that, everyone's going to yell at me. So I will mention it, but just say I've never read it. But for that age group, of course, there's also uh, Lessons for the Young Economists by a certain... Uh, I'm glad you said it, because I can't. You know. <laughs> right here on the screen here is uh, the author of that textbook. But it reads, it's it, you know, to call it a textbook is simply descriptive of you know, what its function is, but it reads in a way that's much more interesting than the typical textbook. Uh, and you can find that book online for free and it's, it's beautifully laid out. Uh, it, it, it looks, it looks terrific and great content and it's just right for that 
age. So lessons for the young economists might be the next. Yeah. One. So like Tom was said, that there's a PDF of that. You know, Mises.org has it. If you go look for that, yeah, just Google it. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, just a quick Texas Tech question, then we're going to get into David Ricardo. If one were to do a PhD at Texas Tech in your program, what fraction of the coursework would be sound economics versus required for the degree but unsound? So, Bob, how uh, how secure is your job there? Right. Well, it's – I'm not trying to be evasive. It's just – it's kind of like if you're getting a PhD in economics, you have to know what everybody else is talking about. Yeah. You know what I mean? So – you know, you, you got to know standard micro theory the way everybody else who's getting a PhD in the United States knows it. So, I mean, it, and it's, I guess what you're saying is, oh, yeah, I know I got to go through, you know, pay my dues, but how bad is it going to be? It, it Texas, they, you'll, you'll be able to take a lot of classes where you're going to love the material. And yeah, your, your first and second year, a lot of it's going to be stuff where, Half of it, you're going to say, okay, I get what they're doing here, but they really just took it too far with it. Now it's all just math. It's not really economic. But even the underlying economics isn't going to be so crazy to you. So uh, I guess I would say 84.7% is going to be sound. Let's take – there are two questions on Ricardo, and given that uh, you've been doing history of economic thought for us, we might as well uh, make sure and answer those. So the first one is, seems like Ricardo was mostly wrong except for his process. What else should we credit him with? So I guess what is what would you say are his chief contributions to the field? Well, what's funny is like what most people think of is oh the law of you know comparative advantage, but I mean it's he didn't come up with that. But but then again, nobody came up with anything. You know, whenever you say oh this guy was the first, usually you can find some precursor. But I mean that's what he's known for, and certainly that's a real important thing and and, this, and that's not an adam smith right so adam smith was doing absolute advantage where he was saying oh i'm making this up but like, yeah england and france should specialize in what they're good at and trade and that makes that makes their people richer than if they you know were were self-sufficient but his examples all relied on the other country being better in absolute terms at the thing it was going to specialize in and so ricardo was the one who popularized among English speakers, you know, the idea of what we now call comparative advantage. Even if one country was better at everything, it still makes sense for that country to specialize in what it's really good at and export. Yeah, I, I off the top of my head, I you're right. I can't think of anything where I'm like, yeah, I'm really glad Ricardo did. In contrast, I, I like the French tradition a lot more. So you're right with, with I mean, the, the, the classical British economists were really good on free trade. And that's really all I can say without reservation, which was important. And, and you could say and they actually achieved something like, you know, Great England or Great Britain really did have relatively free trade. They repealed the corn laws. So, I mean, it's it's not just some academic nicety. They, they really did, you know, things there was there was fruit to that. But, uh, yeah, you're right. I because even the stuff that like um, Straffa who we're going to talk, we talk about in, in part two. We did, uh, is that posted yet? Yeah, I think that is posted already. You know, he, he's called a neo-Ricardian. So even the people in the 20th century who say, you know what, there was a lot in Ricardo that we met. To me, it's like, to, it's horrible. It's, it's like not, it, it throws out the marginal revolution. That's kind of what they mean by saying they're neo-Ricardians is that they're looking at, you know, here's the total output and this much goes to the capitalists, this much goes to the landowners, this goes to the workers without looking at marginal principles and so to, if, if that's what we mean by ricardi ricardo then yeah I, I guess um the idea of rent you could you could say like ricardo advanced that a lot and you know he was focusing on it more in terms of of land like this land's more productive than that land and so you know the the, the plot of land that's just um productive enough or fertile enough to be worth bringing into cultivation that's kind of the baseline and then any other plot that's more fertile than that land gets differential rent. So I think Ricardo had, you know, popularized that idea. And that certainly is related to our modern notion of, of rent and factor productivity and what, what, a, what a factor earns. But yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to come up with stuff that I'm really happy with Ricardo on. So here's the second uh, Ricardo question is the present free flow of labor between countries 
simply a bug in free trade theory or a feature? Did Ricardo address the effect on the host country slash society of such labor flow? Okay, so for sure, the standard demonstrations in Ricardo's works on what we call, you know, comparative advantage and the gains from free trade or the benefits of free trade assume that workers and capital stayed in the countries and then it was just the goods that crossed borders. So I know guys like Paul Craig Roberts were saying, you know, it's it's not that we're saying Ricardo was wrong. It's he was right for the, you know, the institutional structure of the assumptions he made. But now in the 21st century, you know, not, it's not just workers possibly, but capital is mobile. You know, that that's now the big thing. And so now all, you know, all the classical doctrines of free trade go out the window. So so I, I, I'm not going to confidently say Ricardo never talked about it ever to say, suppose we relax as what would happen. I, I don't know. But for sure, his standard exposition and the stuff he's known for in terms of the law of comparative advantage, yeah, had capital and labor were stuck in the respective countries and, and goods could just flow or not, depending on government barriers. Um, so if you're, if you're now asking, like, does that significantly hurt the case for free trade? Well, it's you got to make adjustments for it because obviously if his proof depended on assuming the factors are fixed, if you then allow him to, to move, that might change something. Um, I did. If you Google, I, I when I was talking, if like Robert Murphy critique Paul Craig Roberts or something, and it even say factor mobility, I'm sure you're guys for Mises.org. There was a period there where I was I was going back and forth to Paul Craig Roberts in like the mid 2000s, and I specifically talk about this stuff. I, I think it was actually called Free Trade and Factor Mobility. Might have been the, the title. So if you're asking me, how does the standard Ricardian case change, then that I would point you there and I, I walk through it. So the, the conclusion I gave is the if you want if you study Ricardo's argument first, then that gives you all you need to then be able to see why free trade is still good in other cases too. But um the, the one of the things to just make sure you're doing it right, it is true that if we go from a world where capital can't move to now capital can move certain people might be hurt, but it doesn't follow that if you just draw a boundary around some group of people and call that country X and now say, oh, we're going to artificially constrain capital inside that country, that now we're going to make the people in that country richer than otherwise. That doesn't follow. You don't make people richer by taking away their options. So yeah, if capital can move, then we might be poorer, but that's because other capitalists around the world now can move their capital and that hurts us, but we still gain if our capitalists can move their stuff. They're, they're, our capitalists are richer by having more options. If, see if you follow the logic there. Was reading John Taylor Gatto and he has a take on mandatory schooling as a mechanism for breeding excessive consumerism slash mindless consumers. Is there some conspiracy at play that leads to artificially more consumption is a free marketer okay with scenarios of more consumption as well as less? Um, let me start with this, Bob, and then then you. So first of all, I, I like John Taylor Gatto, but I think even he admits that his work in this area is speculative. I don't think he has a smoking gun where he's got somebody saying this ought to make you know moronic consumers out of these dolts. I, I don't. I, I think he's it's it's a supposition based on a lot of suggestive evidence, but that's about it. Um, but the more interesting question for an economist is, is a free marketer okay with scenarios of more consumption as well as less? The answer would have to be yes, because it's not the role of the economist to make value judgments about how people spend their money. And this is the kind of, uh, this is a reason that Rothbard would scold some economists who would say that the savings rate needs to be higher and the Americans or whoever don't save enough. Well, according to what standard? If I mean, yes, of course, if they saved more, they would pr we'd get more long term production because there'd be more investment and all that. But who says that that's some kind of absolute value? Maybe we'd rather have um, more goods today and, and not not save as much. Well, there's no particular reason to think there's some number we should be striving for. Let people make their own decisions. So I think that that would be the correct value free um, economic answer. Now, of course, as a human being, you're perfectly entitled to your opinion that it would be better for people if they saved more. But economic analysis is supposed to be economic analysis, not moralizing. 
my view is it has moved. So in terms of the economics, like the, the economic science and the policy analysis and stuff, it's what I'm saying now is what I would have said to you probably in high school in terms of that stuff. But my own like views, personality, why or whatever, my own personal opinion, reaction and stuff has changed on this. Um, I don't know if you guys, if this is on your radar or not, but there was, there was, a, I think it might've been a Disney movie called Wally. It was animated. I took my son to it when, when he was a little kid and everything. And at the time I, I really hated it. Like, I mean, not the animation stuff, but like the, the basic premise was, if you don't know it, it's a futuristic scenario and all the, the humans, they're perfectly pleasant. They're nice people, but they're, they're morbidly obese and they're just like sitting in flying chairs that just take them around the ship and they don't do any work. And it's just, and they like, you know, just sit there with big sodas and stuff and the robots do all the work and the earth has been trapped. Like literally it's full of garbage and they had to leave. And so I didn't like it because it, I thought, oh, this is clearly like a critique of consumerism and it's saying capitalism is going to destroy the planet, blah, blah, blah. Whereas now I'm, I still think, you know, I don't like the standard environmentalist alarmism and stuff, but I, I do now like, for example, uh, what's his name? Luke Hamill, the guy who played uh, Luke Skywalker or Mark Hamill, the guy who played Luke Skywalker. I saw a clip of him where he was complaining about the new star Wars movies saying, Oh, they're just doing it to make money. They're, they're not being true to the original vision. And I don't like what they do with my character. And 10 years ago, I would have been like, yeah, that's what the consumers want. Who are you? And now I, I get what he means by that. Like, yeah, there's certain, like, you know, certain artists you could do one thing, you know, or to, they might come out with a sequel to a great movie that's they're clearly just doing it to make money and there's no art. So I'm more open to that kind of critique now. And, you know, like, of course, not that you would, I would have the government do use force to stop them from doing that. But I, I do get now what people mean when they say like, Oh yeah, they're just doing that to make money. And then, you know, they should be striving for something in my, in my art, my job, I'm going to do something differently. Last thing real quickly. What I don't like is, or I think sometimes economists make the mistake where they make it look like everything is about consumption. Um, and so like saying, Oh, in a perfect world, we wouldn't have to work and we would just sit there and just consume and I used to think that was right, and now I think that's wrong. Like I, I, I went to a seminar by the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics, and they were pointing out that even in the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam and Eve jobs to do. And like they were making me think that, oh, yeah, if you really didn't have a job, you would be miserable. It's not that you say, oh, I just get to consume all day and that you, you want to have some sense of purpose. Or so none of that means, oh, so therefore tariffs are good or we should have government intervention or you know cartels. Of course not. But – I I do think now differently about some of those things compared to how I would have said something 15 years ago. Okay, fair enough. Um, actually, l let's do this um, this this one. How similar are the fields of finance and economics? I majored in finance as an undergraduate student. Is it relatively easy to jump between fields? I'm hopefully going to Prague in the fall to study economics, thanks to Tom having Joseph Shima on his show. Finance is a lot more realistic and practical, I would say. So, um, and also, if you have an interest in Austrian economics, you actually could might uh, get along better in in finance than in pure economics, just because a lot of, like the finance people they have mathematical models or whatever, but it's like their equilibrium condition is no arbitrage. It's not assume everything is the same and you know there's perfect knowledge or whatever. So, I mean, it's it's more Derivatives have to be priced such that you can't just, you know, rearrange and buy this and sell that and do a synthetic call and make make a sure thing profit. That can't be the case. And, you know, that that's kind of realistic and that that does need to be the case as opposed to like the perfect competition standard in, in mainstream economics. So um, if, if you like finance and you also presumably have an interest in Austrian stuff, that's why you're watching this thing then, yeah, I, I would say go ahead and, and, and do that. Plus, it might even be easier to get a job, you know, in the in the financial sector with that kind of a background. Okay, how about this one? Empirically, we see that recessions tend to occur when the yield curve is flat or inverted. Why is this? If the Fed's unwinding of the balance sheet keeps the yield curve positive relative to the Fed raising the federal funds rate, how would a recession occur then? Okay, um, shoot, I'm trying to remember – this is something where I think this could be somebody's master's uh, paper. You know, what do you call that? Not thesis. a dissertation. Thesis. Um, 
I don't know why people, I show this to, be, to me, the fact that empirically when the yield curve inverts, there's a recession. And if there's a recession, you can look behind and there was a yield curve inversion. That's Austrian business cycle theory. And I don't know why more Austrians aren't like doing victory laps over that. I mean, if you just think about the standard Austrian story. Wait, wait, time before you tell the standard Austrian story. I bet there are people in the room who don't know what the yield curve is. So they certainly are don't they know. named Tom Woods. <laughs> well, see, well, anytime I want something explained, Bob, I always refer to unnamed people in the room, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. Sorry, everybody. So um, the yield curve, it's its showing like a, um, you got a thing here, and it's uh, if, if going this way is the, the, the maturity, so like a, a three-month bond, a six-month bond, a one-year, uh, you know, and then the yield goes up. So uh, th that's a standard thing where – um, if you're going to tie your money up for a longer period, even the annualized rate of return you get is higher. Okay, so short-term bonds typically, you know, you don't earn much interest at all. Whereas if you're willing to buy a 10-year bond, the yield, even adjusted per year, is higher. Okay, so what it means when the yield curve inverts is that short yields, you know, yields on shorter-term bonds are higher than for longer-term bonds. So that's considered to be unusual. Um, and so I'm, and so, and, and so, when the yield curve does invert, at least like in the 20th century, that typically has been associated with usually there's a recession that follows, and when there is a recession, there has been a yield curve inversion. So they go, you know, one to one with each other, um, and even when it doesn't, it's like a near miss, you know. So it depends on what do you mean by inversion and how soon and that kind of stuff. Um, so it's it's a pretty strong macroeconomic regularity and then people have different theories to explain it and to me the austrians do the best job of explaining why that should be because just think about standard austrian business cycle theory when there's a boom what happens the fed is is uh printing money and buying bonds so if you think about it if the fed's buying a bunch of bonds is that more likely to push down short-term rates or long-term rates because in the short term you know they can really lean heavily on the bond market but in you know a thirty-year bond, if they're buying, if they're printing a bunch of money and buying those bonds, then inflation expectations are going to be higher. So that's going to partially offset just the fact that the Fed's buying it up and you know pushing or bu pushing up the price and pushing down the yield. Whereas you know a six-month bond or whatever, the Fed has a lot more discretion, I would say, in, in pushing down that yield if it wants to. So to me, during the boom phase when the Fed's expanding it makes sense that short yields would be pushed down and long ones might be pushed up because of higher inflation expectations. Then when the Fed hits the brakes and stops buying, what happens, I think you would see short rates would shoot up more than long rates would. And long rates actually might come down a little bit because the Fed's tightening. So you would see an inversion. And so then you say, oh, but why should it be that if the Fed inflates and then slams on the brakes, there's a recession? You'd be like, ah, because there's this thing called the capital structure. So to me, Standard Austrian business cycle theory, if you just thought about the yield curve, you would think, oh, yeah, it would it would invert right before a recession. And so that's what I I've, I've written on that. And I can't I can't remember. Like, it wasn't like I did a standalone paper. It was it was included in some bigger paper that I did. And I can't remember off the top of my head. If you Google Robert Murphy yield curve, Austrian business cycle theory, you might find it. Um, can we uh, let me ask uh, to this one. Uh, somebody says, I'm working my way through Stockman's The Great Deformation, and he's contending that the 2008 collapse was in part due to the repeal of Bretton Woods. Now, I don't think the person means Bretton Woods. I think he means the repeal of Glass-Steagall. So is that what you mean? If so, can you, can, you, can you confirm that in the chat? It was my understanding that it would have happened anyway, but I only dabble in economics and history by reading lots of books. Um, so anyway, so I don't think it was repeal of Bretton Woods. I think you mean Glass-Steagall. And if that's the case... Um, I'll put a few links in the chat window to sources that I particularly like on that subject um, where I don't think Stockman's quite right on that. So, so give me a minute I'll, and I'll, I'll do that while, you know, I'm not paying attention to Bob's answer to the next question. Um, okay. Let's, let's go down. Tom's okay. better on that one. I'm not being facetious that Tom does know. I remember you feel of that on a. I, I wrote about that in in rollback uh, in 2011. By the so, way, folks, if you haven't read rollback, let me go ahead and, and plug it because you know how Tom's timid about selling his books. <laughs> rollback is awesome. Like I was sitting there reading it, and I was like, not only did he do a good job like condensing and synthesizing Austrian stuff, 
but like me, I like it had already, I don't know if it was a bestseller, but it was already selling very well by the point that I actually, you know, had the time to read. And I was just so happy thinking, this is awesome that this is like, you know, something people are passing around and, and like some random guy could be, oh yeah, this makes it. And I, I was just so excited that you were like a, a major publisher or whatever. You know what I mean? Like that was a popular book and it was so not wishy-washy. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. In a way that book has too much information in it. But uh, although it's no comparison to David Stockman's huge thing, but but yeah, no, I I was I appreciate that. I was happy with how it came out. Um, let me. And by the way, don't worry about in terms of selling. I'm never going to earn back the advance on that book ever. So no matter how many copies of Rollback you buy, I'm not getting one more red cent. So buy them all you like, and and uh, and don't worry that I'm going to earn anything. Well, people should ask a follow up question about that. That's interesting. Wasn't yeah, that a think- New York Times bestseller? Oh no no! Actually, rollback did not do very well, and it was partly that they they packaged it so badly. They really made it look like it was a critique of Obama, of which there were eight million. Mm-hmm. So it did not do as well as it should have done. Basically, uh, I think Regnery was a little alarmed at how radical the book was, because Regnery's audience is like fifty eight to sixty five year old men who who right. think that Bill Clinton was just going too far with right. something. You know, and it's my thing is just (laughs) not quite what they want. In fact, I was so upset with them that I went, I basically said, I'm never publishing with you people again, the way you marketed this book. And then I calmed down. I still never publish them with them again, but at least I'm in better spirits toward them. I'm about it. (laughs) And they keep asking me to write books uh, though. And I won't say what, but there, uh, there are a couple of books that, it came out recently that I almost wrote, but I just thought I would hate having to do a Regnery deadline. Cause you know, Regnery gives you like anywhere from two months to six months to do a book at most, right? Six months is if you're, you're Ann Coulter and you can make demands. I mean, they're crazy. And I just thought I saw Brad Berzer, for example, saying on Facebook, you know, when an opportunity comes to write a book, because he got an opportunity, an offer from Regnery, when an opportunity like this comes, you know, a real, real writer takes it. And I, and I said to him, nope. <laughs> Sometimes he says, no, thank you. I'm not doing that to myself, but good for him. Anyway, um, but what it means is that if I don't do the book, they let me suggest people, and sometimes they go with my suggestions. So I'm, I'm like a kingmaker behind the scenes. All right. Ian Coulter was your idea? Yeah, that's right. I, I proposed her. She doesn't work with Regnery anymore. She's way past Regnery at this point. Um, uh, w- one question. Any story behind my regular use of the term smackaroos? I actually use the word smackers. And, um, and, and and by the way, I do want to tell people there is actually a reason for that, that, that when, I, when I say something costs 10 smackers, it's yeah. partly because that's a funny word, and I just like funny words. And uh, but there is actually a, a real reason that I do it, uh, and and I think you might find it interesting. But the, where it came from was as an undergrad, toward the end of my undergrad years, I, I worked as the desk man at an apartment building in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And, you know, I was the guy who buzzed people in or I delivered the mail and to their boxes or whatever. They had food coming up. I'd send them up, basically make sure that an axe murderer doesn't get in. And while I was there, nobody was murdered. It went great. At least now with an axe. <laughs> no, with an axe. That's right. There were a couple of bludgeonings, but that they didn't say anything about that. Guy came in with a baseball bat. How am I to know, right? right. You know, Come maybe back, play. Right. Well, yeah. Well, anyway, I rem- th- there was this woman in the building, this older woman, who obviously had feelings for me. It was extremely awkward. I mean, you know, way older than my own mother at that time. Like way, way older. And she would come down and. It was just really awkward and weird. But I, I do remember her coming in and saying that she had just gotten the flu shot, which I've never gotten. And she said to me, well worth the 10 smackers. I thought, <laughs> smackers? That's a funny word. So at that point, I started using it. Then Brian McClanahan said, you, you can save 200 clams. And I thought, clams, that's better. <laughs> Too late now. Anyway, but the reason I use smackers in, in emails in particular um, cause I have two different email lists is that if you do, if you say dollars, um, you're more likely to get hit by the spam filter that assumes you're trying to sell something. 
Mm -hmm. So I avoid dollars and I say smackers. At this point, everybody has heard me say smackers, so they know it's dollars. But I, it, it improves email deliverability. That's the actual reason. Isn't it, isn't it sad that it has such a prosaic explanation? Well, the fact that it was also based on an older woman who was infatuated. <laughs> I think I made up for it. <laughs> that did. That's right. Um, all right. I'm a high schooler, and I notice a lot of your courses on Liberty Classroom are geared toward a younger audience or high school student. Um, well, actually, I'm gearing them toward adults, but... If you're smart enough to feel like they're at your level, then that's great for you. I'm glad to hear that. I was wondering why you think it's important for people to learn about economics at a young age. And I guess my answer, Bob, would be that, unfortunately, by the time you get older, your, you know, your, your lack of economics, your, your, your prejudice in place of economics, it tends to get so ossified that it can't ever be dislodged. So the sooner you find out about it, the better, I think. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And it's um, I've noticed there's certain things where I just feel like I can like there's some economic issue, you know, and other professional economists or, you know, bloggers that we're talking about. And I'm not saying I'm always the guy, but sometimes I think I see what the central element is in this. And so, like, my take up, like, once people sit there, oh, yeah, yeah, he, he put his finger on that's what it is. And and so I was just trying to think, like, why, why is that? And I think it's because, yeah, when I was like, in seventh grade, I was reading Thomas Sowell and Walter William. Like that's what I was doing. Other, you know, other kids were out there having fun. Not me. I, I was that. That was my fun. And so, yes, the, the fact that I, I like think about that. So I'd be working at the grocery store, my high school job, stocking the milk, and I was thinking about economic stuff. And and so like that, it's so like Tom's saying, just you know, how do how do you get good at something or whatever. If you really like this stuff, then yeah, the earlier you start, you're just going to have that much more of a of an advantage. And really, I can't stress enough just the the people getting a PhD in economics at NYU. You they didn't know what opportunity cost was. Let me just real quickly tell this story. I don't know if you've heard this one time. So the the UAW came. So I folks, I was a member of the of the United Auto Workers Union. Hmm. I'd say, what do you want to Detroit? And we're in a factory? No. I was a grad student at NYU and the UAW came in and unionized us because we were being exploited. And, uh, and so the administration didn't want that to happen. There was going to be a vote. You know, there's the national labor relations law and all that stuff. So there's going to be a vote. And so both sides are campaigning the union and the administration is trying to tell the grad students, no, this is going to really lock in and standardize the relationships. It's you're going to lose flexibility with your professors and we're telling you don't do it. But anyway, they were kids were going to do it because they were promised all this stuff by the union. And so the provost is going around saying, why are you so unhappy? And what, what do you want? And this kid or this guy that was getting a Ph.D. in economics, real smart math guy, said, well, we want to have um, apartment subsidies because the because at the Columbia, they get subsidies. And, and so he goes, OK, well, right now we just give you a, you know, a bunch of money for your stipend. If you want, we can give you less money and give you the difference in terms of a break on NYU housing. But we kind of thought we'd leave the choice up to you. And, the, and this guy getting a PhD in economics goes, no, you own the buildings. So it's free to you. So you should give us the same stipend and give me a break on housing because you own the building. And I was, <laughs> I mean, that's so anyway, that guy clearly had not been reading Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams and had not taken, you know, Liberty <laughs> classroom course when he was in high school because he did not, he was a, he was a good mathematician. He was not a good economist and he was going to get a PhD and go probably work for his government or the central bank or something. So anyway, um, here's an opportunity to actually mention another book by Bob and I'll put the link in the chat. What are your general views on Bitcoin? It's future reliability, et cetera. Um, do you want to tell me what the website is? First of all, Bob, for your book, understanding Bitcoin. Yeah, it's, understandingbitcoin.us. Yeah. And my joke there is the reason we didn't say .com or .org is because those were already taken. So there you go. So yeah, yeah. I was, I was going to say, what other, what else could you say other than that? Yeah. So that was it. Okay. Yeah. So there was a, um, there's, there's a free guide there. Silas Barda is, you know, he's been around libertarian Austrian blogosphere circles for years. And anyway, he, he was a, an early adopter. He was a miner back when, you know, it was, it, you could still make money by having your own system in your house. Like you ordered parts and had the fan going and stuff. So anyway, he understands the, um, you know, the computational stuff. 
And I, of course, was the economic. But I, I think that's a pretty good introduction in terms of the levels of complexity. You know, start with simple analogies and making it get more and more realistic. Uh, if you're asking, like, about the, the hard fork and all that stuff, I mean, I vaguely am aware of the different positions, but I, I don't know enough to take a stand on it. I will say what I do think is funny is the whole point of Bitcoin was supposed to be, oh, it's decentralized. Nobody's in charge. And then you've got people complaining about, oh, yeah, these five developers over here with their cult of personality are going to ruin Bitcoin. And that kind of concerns me. Like, I don't know if that's just exaggeration, but if there really are five guys who could ruin Bitcoin, then Bitcoin isn't what it's supposed to be. So I will say that I'm sure that the the true aficionados are now mad because I said something dumb. But anyway, that's my take. But also, Bob, I mean, I don't know nearly enough about it, but isn't there some concern of some forking thing or some inevitability problem that, that no one knows how they're going to solve? Right. That's why I just, yeah, I said that the hard fork. Yeah, so that's so, the, that's the thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah so there's, there's, yeah, there's, uh, cause the deal is I, I believe um, with the tradition, like the traditional protocol and whatever, it just, the system wasn't going to be able to handle very many transactions, you know, per minute or something. And so the idea was, no, we, this is sort of constrained we can never replace all the credit card system with this architecture. We have to do something. And then the people are arguing about, you know, the pros and cons of doing that. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, I feel like it's, it's like, it's probably not this. The Bitcoin people won't like me for this, uh, uh, me for this, but it's like when people ask me about the Kennedy assassination, Kennedy assassination in Pearl Harbor. I feel like I could never read enough books to finally have a definitive opinion on it. There are so many books out there. I don't know where to begin. So the answer is, I don't know, ask somebody else. So with Bitcoin, I feel like as soon as I open my mouth, I'm going to say something <laughs> stupid. So I, you know what? That doesn't appeal to me. So I'm yeah. not doing that. I, okay. I will say, just since you brought it up, and else to give these people some kind of red meat here because they tuned in, the poor people, they got to get something out of this. I, 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 I still haven't written it up, and I need, probably need to go reread the stuff now because it's been a year. But one time I was really into the JFK stuff. And I was at the point where I would have been very comfortable saying the Warren report is crap. Like that can't be what happened. I, I'm not saying I know what did happen, but I'm saying the Warren report that there's no way that that is what happened. Okay. All right. Okay. I mean, that, that, you, you could well be right about that, but <laughs> it, it's just, if I had an extra three lifetimes. Right. I'm, I'm saying I was at the point where I was going to write something up to say, I'm going to walk you through step by step to show you this can't possibly be right. Like I was that comfortable that I thought I could do that, but then I, I never did it, and now I have to go reread everything. I read like five books, and we were was looking at stuff that I really thought I nailed it down. But uh, by the way, I want to clarify something in the chat. Somebody was saying that that I in one of the episodes said that I call dollars smackers because uh, U.S. Um, Federal Reserve notes aren't real money. I I promise I never said that um, because I I they are real money. They may not be hard money, but if if money is the general medium of exchange, well, what else would it be other than the U.S. dollar? So, so I I, I don't want to be confused. Are you sure you didn't even say it in jest? No, no, I no, I I actually never said because it actually annoys me when people say, "Oh, I don't want that. Give me some real money." Right, right. But well, what do you think people are most likely to accept in exchange? I mean, we don't have to like it. It's just a descriptive. But yeah, okay. But no, no, don't get me started on intrinsic value. You there in the chat? Don't. Get, you're just trying to prolong the Q and A longer than the the time that we agreed to. Okay, uh, let's see if we can we can get uh, one more in here. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Well, let, let, let's try and go back to the second half of the uh, of of the guy's question on the Fed. Where did it go? Yeah, he says if the Fed started unwinding its balance sheet, making long term rates go higher and making the yield curve stay positive, would a recession occur, and how would the Austrian business cycle theory explain this? Sorry, one more time, Tom. Okay. If the Fed started unwinding its balance sheet, making long-term rates go higher, and making the yield curve stay positive, would a recession occur, and how would the Austrian business cycle theory explain this? Well, I guess I'm not – I guess I, I don't know. I'm not saying you're necessarily wrong, but – I don't see why if the Fed started unwinding, that would make long rates go higher than short rates. I mean, because I think the Fed, I haven't looked recently at the composition of their balance sheet, but I think they do own a bunch of short-term bonds, but also 
um, whatever the Fed owns, it doesn't, I mean, that's not decisive. Just when they start dumping bonds, people in the private sector could rearrange their holdings also. And so, um, and all, and if the Fed sells a trillion dollars worth of bonds and sucks a trillion dollars in reserves out of the system, other things equal, that would make people think price inflation is going to be a lot lower going forward. So that would make long-term yields lower than they otherwise would be. So I guess what I'm saying is I, I'm not sure that I agree with you that if the Fed started dumping, that would make the yield curve more normal. It, I, I think it could, it could invert. Um, would you mind if we just try and grab one more quick question? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, it's just about the, um, the Fed and winding down its balance sheet. Can you first explain what that phrase means? And secondly, how do you expect that to go? I mean, successful or a train wreck or what? Yeah. So the, from 2008 onward, the Fed bought a bunch of assets, mortgage-backed securities um, and treasuries. And so it, its balance sheet expanded, right? So in other words, you know, just the, the amount of assets and liabilities that it had expanded greatly. Uh, and so now they're kind of in this weird position where the commercial bank, so and the, the Fed created money, you know, they say out of thin air electronically to do that, right? The Fed just buys a billion dollars worth of bonds. The person that buys it from the seller just now has a billion dollar check electronically and they can deposit in their bank. And that bank now has a billion dollars more in its checking account with the Fed, as it were. So um, to unwind its balance sheet means the Fed is going to sell off or just let the stuff mature and not buy new bonds so that it's it's sucking money out of the system and getting rid of bonds, getting rid of assets so that its balance sheet shrinks. So most people think ultimately it would have to do that to go back to total being normal. Um, and so right now they're in this weird holding pattern. Like when, when they want to raise interest rates, the textbook method is the, the Fed would sell off assets and suck money out of the system. And so then now there's less money in the loanable funds market. So the, the market clearing interest rate would be higher. They don't want to do that because if they sold off treasuries that would push up treasury yields, which would make it really expensive to serve service the national debt, which is trillions of dollars higher now than it was just, you know, eight years ago. Um, and if they sold off mortgage backed securities that might crash the housing market. So the fed wants to raise rates, but without selling off its assets. So it's been raising the, the um, um, amount of interest that the Fed pays to banks to keep their money parked at the Fed. And that's a new policy that was instituted in October of 2008. So it's this weird thing where the Fed's earning interest on its bonds from money created out of thin air to then pay commercial banks to not make loans to their customers. So it's this totally messed up system. Um, so how are they going to get out of it? I, I don't see how they, they can. I mean, the, the, the theory is always the economy returns to normal, we'll slowly let the balance sheet shrink and that won't shock the system and we'll just gradually ease our way out of it and unwind. I don't, I don't see that, that happening, but I've been surprised they were allowed to get by this long without there being a major crisis. So, Okay, well, let me ask, why would they, why would they need to get out of it? I mean, okay. why would they – I mean, like we can see why they need to get yeah. out of it. Why would the regular economists think they this is an unsustainable situation? Okay, um, they, they some economists don't think they do. Some some would say no. We're in this new normal now, where oh, that's true. Secular stagnation, and you know, for as far as the eye can see, this is it. Okay, but if you if you think that the that things might start going back to normal ten years from now, eventually, what would happen is, I mean, the, the commercial banks are. I haven't looked at the numbers. They're sitting on, I want to say like 800 billion or more of excess reserves, which you meaning money they have, they legally are allowed to lend out and they just have chosen not to because the, the lending situation doesn't seem right. It's not because there's a, a constraint for regulatory reasons. And so if they started doing that, you know, the, the money in people's hands would, would go up and presumably that would start pushing up prices. So at some point the thinking is, or my thinking is they, the Fed's going to have to tighten and they can't for a little while they can raise interest rates by the mechanism I, I said, where they're just paying banks to keep the money parked there. But at some point the Fed, the amount of income the Fed earns from its assets is not going to be enough to pay banks the interest rate 
that they would need to. Like if interest rates are, in other words, when they're paying banks 75 basis points, that's not a big deal or it's not a humongous deal. If they have to pay banks 4% on whatever, a trillion dollars of excess reserves, that's a lot of money. And so at some point, the Fed's not going to be able to afford to do it. And then that's when, you know, are they going to start using tax dollars to pay banks to not make loans to people? So it, I think at some point this they're in this nice situation where they're having their cake and eat it too. But I, I don't think it can stay like this forever. All right, that's going to do it for today. But I want to tell you about another podcast. So I'm see, I'm in incredibly good sport telling you about other podcasts. But this one is Battle for Liberty. You can check it out at battleforliberty.com. That's great that that domain was available, battleforliberty.com. And the Battle for Liberty podcast is going to cover a lot of topics that come up in conversation, like the environment or the Pledge of Allegiance or – what people say to you when you say taxation is theft and how to respond. All kinds of interesting questions. Air traffic control. Some, sometimes hard questions are addressed at battleforliberty.com. It's a podcast I think you'll enjoy, and I urge you to check it out. Battleforliberty.com will be listed on the show notes page for today, which is tomwoods.com slash 960. As the listener website mentioned, and as you know, you can get mentioned too, just like this. If you're thinking of starting a website, don't start it until you check out my bonuses and how to get them at tomwoods.com slash publicity, because I will help you get traffic and other good things as you head out the gate into the world of the Internet. So check that all out at tomwoods.com slash publicity, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.